Advanced Financial Accounting. In this presentation, we're going to talk about the concepts of direct and indirect control. Get ready to account with Advanced Financial Accounting. We want to consider these concepts within the context of financial statements and consolidation. So you'll recall that when we have consolidated financial statements, the idea is to put two financial statements together when one company has basically control over another company, that being defined typically by having more than 51% interest. Because if you have more than 51%, then you have basically a voting share. If you to vote on anything, then of course you would win the vote at that point in time. So let's consider then direct control and indirect control. Direct control when one company has a majority of another company's stock, common stock. So that would be a situation where you got A and B, one company has a majority interest over 51%. Control is, is pretty easy to see at that point. When you start to get into indirect control, this can get more complicated. Things can get more confusing here. So indirect control, one company's common stock is owned by one or more other companies that are under common control. So this can get a lot more uh, detailed structure in terms of what is going to constitute control. So for example, if we have direct control, then you have just simply a parent subsidiary type of relationship. And, uh, you know, the parent has more than 51% of the subsidiary uh, interest, common stock. So, and that could happen if we have two, we could still have a little bit more complexity here where we have two subsidiaries, right? But they're both going to be consolidated in this case because there's 75% over 51% direct control is parent over S1, direct control over S2 here because it's over the 51%. So both of these cases would be direct control. Obviously, you can think of a, a parent subsidiary relationship where we have more uh, subsidiaries that are all owned over 51%. But it can get more complex than that when you think of indirect control. For example, if you have A being the parent company here that open, owns 75% of B, then they have a controlling interest in B. But what if B then owns the S company down here? So B owns S company. So that means that A doesn't have a direct interest in S. A doesn't have a direct interest in S. A doesn't own any of S's stock. However, a does own a controlling interest in B stock. So basically there's a parent subsidiary relationship happening there and B owns a controlling interest in S. So that you would think then, okay, well now since A has control over whatever B does in essence because they have a controlling interest and B has control over whatever S does, you can say, well, it looks a whole lot like A has, uh, you know, indirect control <laughs> over S. And so you can see that that's kind of the most simple kind of situation. Notice it can get a lot more complex. You can start, once you start playing with this, you can say, okay, you can see a lot of different scenarios where you can have complex corporate structures, right? So now you can, you can say, okay, well, what if A had a controlling interest in B with 75%, for example, and anything over 51% would be controlling, right? And, and they had a controlling interest in C over here at 60%. Uh, and then these two companies, they don't, so A doesn't own anything of S company down here directly. They don't have any common stock. However, they have a controlling interest in B and B owns 40%. 40% isn't controlling because controlling typically would be over 51%, but they got 40% here. But then they, they also have a controlling, A has a controlling interest in C and C has 25% owned in s so therefore between b and c they own uh 40 65 percent which is over the 51 percent so again you would think okay well it looks a lot like a since a can kind of tell b to do whatever they want because they have a controlling interest and they can tell c to do whatever they want and then if you combine b and c together then they own a, over 51 percent of s it looks a whole lot like A can pretty much tell S to do whatever they want, which means that they pretty much have control, an indirect control in that in that situation. And again, you can think of a lot more, you know, structures. You could, this thing starts to get somewhat complex on how this how this uh, could be set up. 
exercise control ability. That's really what we're relying on when we're looking at these structures. We're saying, hey, can they exercise their control? If they have over 51%, you would think that would be the case. But there could be situations where they, they look like they have a controlling structure, but there may be reasons why they cannot exercise control. And if they cannot exercise the control, then the consolidation would typically not be used. So the consolidation is not used if the subsidiary is involved in a bankruptcy or reorganization. Why? Because now there's there's another entity that's now going to be involved in governing the bankruptcy and or reorganization process. And therefore, the you know control isn't basically in, in the hands possibly of, of the parent company during that kind of process. A foreign country restricts the remittance of profits to the parent company. So if, you know, the company's in a, in a foreign company, then there could be restrictions that then restrict the control, the ability to exercise control. And there, therefore, you would think that consolidation under those types of restrictions uh, may not be necessary or the proper format. Uh, fiscal period difference between parent and subsidiary. So once you start thinking about, okay, now we're going to do a consolidation, right? Well, you can start to think about problems with the consolidation. You could say, okay, some of the normal problems you're going to have, you're going to say, well, what if they don't own 100%? What about these complex kind of structures? You know, how do you, how exactly are you going to be combining those? Should you combine the entire amounts or should you be con combining just the controlling interest if there's a less than 100% interest? Then you also have questions about, well, what if the, the, the fiscal period is different? So obviously, if they all had a calendar year in January to December, then no problem in that situation for, for this particular problem, you can put them all together. But what if one of them has a different year end, fiscal year end? How, how can we account for that? Well, uh, we'll, we'll not stop the consolidation, although it can complicate the process. We're still going to basically try to do the consolidation in accordance with the regulations in that situation. The subsidiary is generally, but not always, change to the parent fiscal period so the easiest thing to do typically would say okay now we've got you know a parent subsidiary relationship we have a relationship in which we should probably be reporting consolidated financial statements let's why don't we just adjust the subsidiaries books to be on the same uh, fiscal period as the parent and make this as easy as possible that would simplify the process that would be the logical thing to do but if that's not done for whatever reason maybe we still want you know you still want to report the financial statements for the subsidiaries on a different period, it might be beneficial to do so. Then if not, the data of the subsidiary can be adjusted each period to line up with the basis of the parent's fiscal period. So basically, then you'd have to, you know, run almost the books, basically, as if you had two different fiscal periods closing out the books, you know, you know, on two fiscal period accounts, that would be a more difficult thing to do. But you can, you know, obviously adjust the data in order to co accommodate that kind of scenario.